Does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? Uh, recognize myself for such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. More of the same. As with our consideration of the quote in Force Act, H.R. 4131, 4138, I must note the lack of a deliberative process pertaining to the consideration of this bill. Uh, the gentleman from South Carolina spoke eloquently on the other bill and talked about the need for process, the importance of process, and process can be important. Process was not important on this bill, wasn't important on the other bill. Like that other bill, the Judiciary Committee failed to hold a single legislative hearing. Process is you have a hearing, people come in and talk, experts, then you have a markup in the sub, first you start the subcommittee, and the subcommittee has a hearing and they have a markup, and then you have a hearing and a markup in the full committee. This one, not a hearing in the subcommittee, not a markup in the subcommittee, not a hearing in the committee. Simply, all of a sudden, presto, markup, process, nixed. That's how we came with the last bill and this bill. When coupled with the fact that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle provided only a minimum notice regarding the bill, it's hard to believe that this is a serious attempt to legislate because it tramples on the legislative process, the rights of the minority to have notice, rights of the public to have notice, and the right to have a hearing with experts testifying. And unfortunately, the end product evidence is what happens when you don't follow regular order, which is due process, notice, and a hearing. We tr do the same thing here. Here are just a few of the problems with this bill. H.R. 3973 would impose burdensome and wasteful requirements on the Justice Department to the detriment of its law enforcement functions. Probably have to hire new personnel, increase the debt, which of course is the other side always talks about being passed on to the next generation. Section 530D of Title 28 of the United States Code already requires the Attorney General to report to Congress any instance in which the Attorney General or any Justice Department official establishes or implements a formal or informal policy against enforcing, applying, or administering a provision of federal law on the ground such provision is unconstitutional. And there are 94 U.S. attorneys and a whole bunch of agency heads and a whole bunch of cabinet members and folks. Current law therefore allows an administration to refuse to enforce a law in the extremely limited circumstance where a law is deemed unconstitutional. No other reason is sufficient. 3973 fails to define exactly which individuals in the federal government would qualify as a, quote, federal officer. There is nowhere in the U.S. that I have seen, and we've researched it, where the, this Congress has defined a federal officer and yet we're instructing federal officers. Now the courts might have had some gibberish, but this Congress never did. As a result of this oversight, the Attorney General would have to review enforcement decisions by hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals who work in the executive branch and may qualify as officers in order to determine whether their decisions trigger the requirements in this bill. This burden would drain already limited resources in the Justice Department for its law enforcement responsibilities, which is its charge. The majority's real purpose of H.R. 3973 is to prevent the President's implementation of duly enacted legislative initiatives that they oppose and to stymie the President's considerate discretion in enforcing those laws. Allowing flexibility in the implementation of a new program, even where the statute mandates a specific deadline, is neither unusual nor a constitutional violation, and it's happened with administration to administration to administration. Such flexibility is inherent in the President's duty to take care and that he faithfully execute the laws. And the exercise of enforcement discretion is the power, traditional power, of the executive. Not surprisingly, the Supreme Court has consistently held that the exercise of such discretion is a function of the President's power under the Take Care Clause. And this principle is reiterated by the Court in 2012 in Arizona versus United States. This is particularly true if the bill's proponents intend to reach decisions like the deferred action on removing dreamers from the country. That decision was a routine exercise of enforcement discretion, but H.R. 3973 would require the Attorney General to report on every routine de decision to Congress. You can't 
enforce every law to the fullest and prosecutors and people make decisions on which are the most important and which are prioritized. Professor Christopher Schroeder, a minority witness on this uh, from the on the Judiciary Committee, noted the number of such enforcement decisions is simply too numerous to count. Given the foregoing, I must reiterate that this process is a waste of our time, especially when there are other far more pressing concerns to address. How many times have we had people call us and tell us that they need unemployment compensation, that they don't have money to buy goods, to buy food for their child, to buy food for themselves, or to provide shelter, and yet unemployment insurance has lapsed? How many times do we have people say they want to work and get a job, but we haven't passed an infrastructure bill? That's usually a bipartisan measure. For years, has been bipartisan. Mr. Bill Young, he worked well on these bills, getting things done. We don't have infrastructure bills to keep us going, to deliver goods and services and put people to work. How many times do people come up and talk to us about their concerns about health care? when We could be maybe coming together and finding ways to make health care even more affordable. The Affordable Care Act was the beginning, giving a lot of people health care they otherwise didn't have. In my district, the d differential between African-American women and white women in morbidity on breast cancer is the greatest it is in the country. And throughout the country, African-American women are more likely to die of breast cancer than Caucasians. Why is that? It's not in their genes. No, Ms. Madam Speaker, it's not in their genes. It's because they have not had access to insurance and health facilities to get mammograms and to get checkups and to get treated. They don't have the ability to get those health centers, which have been funded through the Affordable Care Act, more and more health centers, community health centers, because of the Affordable Care Act, and to get insurance, which they're getting insurance. But in the past, they haven't got it. Their morbidity rate is greater, and they've died. Sometimes it's because they don't have transportation to the doctors. And that's because of our limited resources we put in funding mass transit. So in so many areas which we've neglected, it should be dealing with now on health care issues on the environment, on immigration, taking people out from the shadows and putting them to work legally where they pay taxes, and where young people brought here with their parents who have made great grades in school could go to college and stay here and participate and fulfill their dream and fulfill their potential, work hard and play by the rules. We're not doing that. Instead of using these limited legislative time we've got this is yet another opportunity to bash immigrants or to rail against giving health insurance to those who would otherwise be without it. We should be addressing these broken systems that we have on immigration, helping struggling homeowners and students buried in debt, and fighting discrimination, among many other challenges facing our great nation. Allowing people every opportunity to vote rather than taking voting opportunities away from them at every opportunity possible. That's the antithesis of America trying to deny people the opportunity to vote under the veil of identity. We are doing a disservice to the American people in choosing to spend our time on these issues, which aren't issues that are not going to pass the Senate and see the light of day and we know it, instead of trying to come together and work with the, each other. I've reached out to members on the other side and said, why don't we find common ground and pass something? And they kind of look at me and say, I get my orders too. Unfortunately, the orders aren't working for the American people. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I now yield myself such time as I may consume. And I begin by just pointing out uh, contrary.